This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. Okay. Assalamualaikum. We're going to get started, inshallah. Bismillah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So maybe just to get things going, if you guys want to turn to the person next to you, I know most of you probably know each other kind of in some capacity, acquaintanceship, maybe your closer friends. Um, but just in terms of the coming Ramadan, how has preparation been so far? Kind of where are your thoughts on around it? And then we'll get into some of what we're talking about tonight. So all these things, I think, are important principles to understand, but we want to have a baseline set of guidelines to recognize why does the heart have anything to do with this, right? Functionally, what role does it play? And creating a definition, I think, is going to be important in being able to then recognize the impact because you live societally in a space that is heavily influenced by ideologies like supremacy and capitalism and patriarchy. They're not telling you to look inward. They're telling you to focus purely outward. And the idea is to engage now only inward when you are seeking to elevate the fulfillment of your fundamental wants egocentrically, even at the expense of your own needs rather than the needs of others. The heart that we keep talking about needs to have definition to it so that we can start to think out like, yes, all of these things are important, but what does it have to do with the heart, right? Why are we citing the heart as the mechanism or component, the seat of it. Like fundamentally, what does Islam posit about this part of you that it becomes crucial to then prep it or relate to it or engage in a conscious mode of exertion towards it in relation, not just to Ramadan, but even beyond? Do you get what I'm saying, right? So what is it? What do we say the heart is when we're saying this word? Yeah. So the soul in Arabic is the ruh, right? That's the soul. So what's the heart? Intention, Intention is niya. And I'm not trying to be difficult, but we want to like think out what these words mean and the definitions that are there, right? And what somebody said before was that the seat of niya, the seat of intention is the heart, right? So there's a relation there and there's a relation to everything because all of you is connected to the rest of you. You know, so if I came and, you know, I pinched Arland and his arm, it's going to yield like a response in the rest of his body, right? If you have a fever, it's not just that a part of you aches, but the rest of you gets exhausted, right? Like you are connected to your entire being. So these different parts of us make a difference to understand how they function. But when we're talking about the preparation of the heart, we don't want it to be like a platitudinal conversation, right? Or something that is kind of intangible because it's filled with statements that are not necessarily rooted in something that are concrete or practical, but it creates now a base that allows for us to build a relationship that says to me subjectively, this part of me is so important that I'm not going to give it up for anything, right? Right. I'm not going to let it go for something of complacency or materialistic. You know, Ali radiallahu an, he says that your hearts, they are equivalent to the price of paradise. So don't give them up for anything other than that price, right? It's worth Jannah. That's all that it is. May Allah make us from the people of Jannah. But to understand its importance, its role, its utility, its function, we got to know what it is first. Do you know what I mean? What is it? Other things. What is the heart when we talk about it? So let's talk about the spiritual heart and delve into that a little bit deeper because the preparation of your physical heart is also important. And there's a relationship between these two. But looking at it from the standpoint first of the spiritual heart, there's going to be four layers to your heart that our theology and spiritual system posits makes your heart in its entirety, right? The outermost layer 
of your spiritual heart is what's called the sadr, right? Like a lot of you know the dua of Musa alayhi salam, Rabbi shrahli sadri, right? That, oh Allah, expand for me my chest, right? Or in the Quran, Allah says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alam nashrah laka sadrak, that did we not expand for you your chest? It's talking about the sadr. It's the outermost layer of the heart, right? Uh, Surat al-Nas, alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudur al-Nas, right? That's where shaitan whispers into, that outer part of the, the heart, the sadr. You now have what becomes three distinct layers from the sadr. The qalb is the spiritual heart. That's what the name is of the spiritual heart. Does anybody know what this means etymologically? Or if we were to break it down in its Arabic? Yeah. To flip something. Yeah, it means to flip something, right? So we have a dua where we call upon Allah. Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubana ala dinik. O turner of hearts, make firm my heart upon your deen, Right? Why does the heart get called qalb in the sense of turning things over? What do you think? Like literally, like flipping it around, turning it around, upside down. Yeah. Yeah. Your heart can jump around in circles, right? You ever in a place where it's just like all over? Like you're saying, I'm exhausted. I'm stressed. School is like this. People are like this. I'm in this place of just kind of overwhelmingness, or even if you're just in a place where you're fully ecstatic and you're just excited, you have places where literally your inside feels like it's turning upside down, going around and around. That's the qalb. The nature of the qalb is that it can go in all different directions. It can be in a place where you're in one sphere and then it does a complete 180 and now you're attached to something totally different and separate from it. It's the most generic form of an understanding of what the heart is. You then have what's called the fu'ad. And some would say this is a different layer of the heart. Or the fu'ad is just the qalb when it's now in an emotional state. Right? So the word fu'ad in Arabic, it shares the same derivative root as when a piece of meat is being roasted under a flame. Does it make sense? Right? It's called fa'id. So the word, in Arabic, if you have words that share common root letters, they have like a connection to them, right? Like Islam, Salam, Muslim. They all have the root Sin, lam, mean, right? Sa, la, ma. And you can see the connection between those words. So the word fu'ad, it shares the same root as the word that means when you're essentially like roasting meat over a flame, right? So the fu'ad is either understood to be a third sphere of the heart or emotions rest. So Musa alayhi salam's mother in the Quran, when she leaves Moses as a baby, when it speaks about her state, it talks about her fu'ad. Because that's where the anxiety is. That's where the emotional distress is. That's where all of that comes up, right? And it can be the qalb in a state inflamed. Because think about what's going on when you're feeling really emotionally kind of all over the place. Your heart feels like it's literally inflamed. It's on fire, right? So that fu'ad is now in reference to the space of emotion. Does this make sense so far? Yeah? And then the last space is what's called the lub. And this is kind of the sphere of the heart in which cognitively the function of the heart can still be an organ of cognition. And so the way that we understand it, or it's defined, for example, the lobe's relationship to the qalb is likened to the relationship of the Kaaba to Mecca. Or if you were to illustrate this as an eye, the qalb is the eye, the fu'ad is its pupil, 
And the lobe is the light that passes through it, that gives you vision, that gives you clarity. So in the Quran, it talks a lot about the ulul al-bab, the people of lob, the people of intellect, right? But it's talking about an aspect of the heart. Do you see? And so these four spheres of the heart now, they are what's making up the spiritual heart when we're talking about it. And when we're talking about it, we're talking about this now as playing a key role functionally. It's got utility to it. What's the point of the heart? But let me do this first, as you think about that. So we talked about the ruh, we talked about niya. Some of you have seen me talk about this before, but just to break it down, you have the aql, which is intellect, but it's not just your mind, right? The aql refers in particular to the ability to discern right from wrong through the prism of what Sharia talks about, right? You have what's called the jasad, the badan. This is your body, your physical being. Then we have the qalb, which we talked about. That's your spiritual heart. And then we have what's called irada, which is your sheer will and determination. All of this makes you an entire individual. This is like an Islamic framework of the self. And quite often the focus, though, day to day just ends up being on this, right? And there's impact there. If you fast, it's going to impact your jasad, but it's also meant to impact the rest of these things. You see? And so when you get to a place now, when you're sitting in class, how many people in your classes are saying to you things that talk to you about the betterment of the rest of what makes you you? Or the pursuit of your professional ambition in terms of what you are going to work for in this worldly existence? How much are you thinking about it in the frame of the other parts that make you whole? Right? So I'm going to become a lawyer because I'm going to essentially make money. It's not a bad thing. Don't think about it as just right or wrong or good and bad. But you think about it in the prism of the rest of you and what makes you you. Or you think about even ritual and practice, right? We become quite often, this is the danger of religion that has ritual to it. It becomes just about the form and the external. So I just learn fiqh and fiqh and fiqh, which is important, but I'm not learning it in relation to the rest of what I have going on as a spiritual vehicle. And now it just becomes an external or a form, right? And like you were saying, you don't know, like the gossip is still doing something to your heart. So you can take the external and the knowledge that is fiqh based, but if you don't know how to apply it inwardly, it now becomes that same mechanism that I walk into the musalla. And I'm trying to see, like, who's not dressed right? Who's not praying right? And I take something that's meant to be a positive, and it reframes itself now purely at the level of the external, because I don't know how to look from these other parts of myself. I can't see from these things. I'm only now engaged at the level of the physical. You see what I'm saying? What Allah is doing in Ramadan is saying refrain from the physical feeding alone and start to focus on other parts of yourself that also incorporate this and become an inroad into understanding the rest of what makes you who you are. You get what I mean? Yeah. But what does it mean? What, it, what do you take from what I'm saying so far? What does it make you think about? What right now do you think is the state of your relationship to your aql? If you were to define it in your own head, right? Like, just think about it. If you were to think about the relationship you have to any parts of what make you, you as a whole, 
And beyond what the overt emphasis is, what it is that goes into your classroom, which you've been socialized with. But right now, if you were to just assess for yourself, right? Because if I want to get to here, this is my destination. In order for me to understand how to reach it, I have to know where I stand in relation to it. And a lot of us don't get to where we want to be, not because we don't have goals and aspirations, right? I want to do 100 rak'ah right? I want to be able to do other things that I have. That's amazing. A challenge that comes in in being able to get to where we want to be isn't that I don't know what this is, but I don't actually know where I'm starting from. And so it's hard for me to get here because my beginning point is skewed and I might think that I'm actually here. But so if I'm taking steps this way, because that's what my perception is, in reality, I'm here. I'm not going to get there. It's going to end me up over here. And then I'm going to wonder, am I doing this religion right? You see what I mean? The preparation of your inward is going to necessitate something that's very introspective and subjective. In order for you and I to be able to become comfortable with it, we're going to have to start spending some time first with that part of ourselves, right? The spiritual heart, what does it do? What's its function supposed to be ideally? In relation to the rest of this, right? This is you. What's the heart's relation to you and your entirety? The heart's supposed to be in charge. It's supposed to be what's sovereign over us, right? You don't want the nafs to be what's in charge. You don't want it to be what's dictating. You don't want the physical to be in charge. You don't want that to be what's defining and dictating. So in order for the qalb to take its role as being sovereign, you got to first pay attention to it a little bit and know what's going into it. To be able to captivate and compel and engage at the level of hearts and connect at the level of hearts, as opposed to just the levels of things that exist externally, right? This is why you all likely go to many masjids where there's tons of people who don't talk to other people who are of distinct racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds. The connections that exist are not at the level of shared internals, shared hearts, shared values, but shared externals. That's what supremacy roots itself in. It's a very shallow and hollow ideology because it idolizes the self purely in a state of primordiality that is attached to a misconception and a gross misconception of that that claims whiteness to be the primordial state. It's all just rooted in this. And what our tradition calls us to is something that's much bigger than it. And understanding how all of the different parts of you relate to this. Because if intention is rooted in the heart, the heart is the seat of Nia. If you can have people who understand that the lub plays a role in also determining intellectual capacity, everything is going to, in a worldly sense, be rooted in terms of how the heart plays a prominent role. And if it's not paid attention to, or it's silenced, or it's diluted, then it's not going to necessarily be what is determining how the rest of you functions and moves. So the nafs is going to get in the way. And it's going to then be what determines how you move forward, right? Think about your physical being. If this is you, right? Of these parts of you, the intellect and the heart are literally in your upper self. The stomach, the sexual organs are in the lower self. Allah has designed us in a mode to be able to just look to ourselves for reflection of what is it that's going to be choosing my choices for me? What is it that's going to be deciding my decisions? And we're meant to be a people who make decisions through our hearts and not at their expense. You get what I'm saying? So if you don't think about it to begin with, 
and to understand, even if you don't buy into kind of the spiritual framework, sadr, qalb, fu'ad, lub, if you just buy in at least to the fact that there is one of these, a spiritual heart, it's basic framework, forget about it. If you don't spend so much time engaging it or relating to it or understanding its nature, like you're talking about hardness and softness of the heart, the heart can be alive, which means it can also be dead. It can be wakeful, but it can also be just asleep, right? The Prophet ﷺ was asked about the nature of his heart in relation to his physical slumber. He says, that my eyes, they sleep, but my heart does not sleep. That even where his physical body is in a mode of slumber, his heart is ever in a state of wakefulness. May Allah grant us hearts that are like this. To get to it can't always just be organic. The parts of Ramadan that are amazing that you don't have to have presence of mind in that start to awaken this for you goes through this process now, right? You feel it like you literally feel it. We're a week out. I'm starting to feel it. It feels different. And then you get to a place where you get in the last 10 nights and you're able to now stand for hours in prayer. You're not in a place where you're just constantly feeding your stomach. The mode of conversations you're engaged in day to day, they start to change a little bit. Your habit, your demeanor, your personality, your character, what is happening is the heart is becoming sovereign. The obstacle that comes in the way is that you're not thinking about how that's happening. And everything that's going into now creating that state of wakefulness, does it feel good when you're in those moments of Ramadan? When you were saying, like, you're a week out and you're starting to feel it, does it feel better when you're in Ramadan than outside of it? It does, right? If you could put that feeling in a bottle and capture it so you feel it throughout the rest of the year, would you want to do that or no? So what you got to do in the preparation of the heart is use this month of Shaban to start thinking out what's going on that on its own, without me having to fully think about it, yields me that kind of relationship in Ramadan so that I'm now deliberately engaging the other parts of myself to say, how do I harness it strategically as best as I can throughout the rest of the year? So it's not a joke, man, that you're going to be praying in Jamaah probably every day of Maghrib, right? Many of you are going to be praying and breaking fast together, and your fasting is a spiritual act. What's going to keep you from doing it once the month is done? You're going to hear Quran and read Quran and listen to Quran in whatever capacity you have access to it. You're not in a space where you are in comparison to somebody else. You don't want that to be your habit. You want to think interiorly as to who you are here and where the person you are today can meet the person you can become tomorrow. But what keeps you? you from continuing on with it might not just be outward because the world is still the same right you gotta still figure out how to do these things in terms of classes and exams and whatever else and you'll see your ability to do it but because it's not being seen beyond here experientially and it's not being seen from here it's going to be easy to let go of because you didn't bring your mind into thinking out What's the process that's really happening within me? There's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, he says, As-Sawmu Jannah, that fasting is a shield. People heard this hadith, right? Well, it's a hadith. Just take my word for it. What does it mean? Fasting is a shield. What do you think? Yeah. It's oftentimes a preventative measure for sins that we would have otherwise fallen into. Yeah. Taqwa that is connected to Quran and Saum, right? Kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala ladina min kablikum la'allakum tatakun. Taqwa is rooted in the Arabic root wikaya, which also is a shield, right? 
There's a hadith where the Prophet وسلم, says that wudu is the weapon of the believer. Dua is the weapon of the believer. Right? This language is not meant to be military-esque or that we kind of submit to people's worst stereotypes about us. But for example, these guys are all praying right now. Right? You go into a masjid where you have a prayer niche in the masjid. What's that called in Arabic? Huh? Mihrab. The mehrab. The word mehrab in Arabic has the same root as the word for war, harb. So you go stand in that prayer mat, you stand over there, the battle you're engaged in is not outward, it's inward. A salmu junna is not that I got a shield that's protecting me from the fitin of the dunya. A salmu junna is I'm also in a place where the fasting is helping me to stand up in the battle that's taking place inside of me every day. If you don't recognize the preciousness of your heart, it doesn't mean that shaitan does not. And Allah gave to you a protection because in the different layers of the heart, he can only whisper into the sadr. nas. <laughs> So what goes on in the qalb, the fu'ad, in the lub, that's your decision. The whispers don't go past the sadr. Does that make sense? As-salm, jannah taqwa, wikaya, all of these things, you think about it from the paradigm standpoint of the battle that's going on within you. And the adversaries that seek to control your inner self so that you become diluted of what is the most precious part of you, which is this thing right here. Do you get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? And your level of spirituality is going to be measured through the metric of your decision-making. If you want to know where your heart is right now, just look at your choices. What's going into your decision-making? You want to know as a metric of what the state of your heart is, look at how you treat people. Look at how you treat the world around you. Look at how you treat creation. Look at how you treat yourself. Do you get what I'm saying? So in being able to think about that now, in the standpoint of so much of what our tradition, our book tells us, right? That indeed in your jasad, in your body, your being, there is a morsel of flesh. If it's good, everything else is going to be good. If it is not good, everything else will not be good. Indeed, it is your heart. It is your qalb. How much time in a day do you spend just thinking about the state of your heart? We're providing care to it and nourishment and nurture. Because the fu'ad is a real concept, an inflamed heart. How much time do you talk speaking to people that make sense about the pain you carry in your heart, the anxieties, the difficulties? Classes are not going well. Parents don't really talk to me so well. Dealing with grief, loss of loved ones I've never experienced before, sickness, ailment, failing out of school, financial issues. These are not things that you just push a button and suddenly you're happy and you're sad. The preparation of the heart necessitates understanding yourself as a whole being and thinking out what are the things that really cultivate and nurture that sense of wakefulness that allows for invigoration. Do you see what I mean? What Ramadan gives us an insight to is not empty stomachs. Ramadan is about full hearts. And it's telling you that at least what you understand is that consumption is not the mechanism to find joy in your qalb. It's not going to do that for you. Because you feel, in your own words, you've said, increase in your celestial self as you are reducing intake of consumption. And you're being more generous in your days to stand and make du'a for things, for your loved ones, for the people you know, right? Most of you have probably 
never in your life made dua for my grandparents. That doesn't mean you're a bad person, but why in your consciousness would it come into existence the reality of my grandfathers and grandmothers? There's only certain people whose names you know that the rest of us don't know. And in Ramadan, you're willing to shift the paradigm to say, I buy into the idea that the nights are filled with barakah. I buy into the idea that Allah's command to me has benefit to it. That transformative nature is something now, if you start to apply different insight strategically, contentment is not meant to start and stop with the first of Ramadan and end on the day of Eid al-Fitr. But contentment is something that people of Iman are allowed to access by the acquisition of real rida, real contentment that carries them through the remainder of their days in this world, right? And that's where the choices are critical. You have to choose to want to feel that in your life because you're not in a place where any one of us is going to come and knock on your dorm door and say, did you wake up for suhoor? We're also not going to be able to hold your hand and bring you to pray in the evening or have iftar together. You're going to wake up and choose your choices. You're going to wake up and act upon what you're feeling. You're going to move based off of what you determine makes the most sense for your movement. Allah gives us the gift of Ramadan to help us remember that the best part of us to make those decisions through is the heart. It is the qalb. Does it make sense? So what are some things that you could do practically to start to engage in preparation for it? What do we think? How do you start to ready your heart? So why don't we do this? Because I've been talking a lot, right? Is everybody okay? Are you guys... Still fine? We're good? Yeah. Okay. Turn to the person next to you. Do not confine yourself to only speaking what you believe is right. This is not that kind of space, right? We want to benefit from each other's insight. Think about it in the prism that you are an entire person, not just any one part of you. So the preparation of your heart, for example, can be impacted by your level of physical wellness, how you sleep, how you exercise. These things can bear impact on your celestial self. Don't jump to correct somebody. That's not your role in being in conversation. Just listen. So the person that's talking to you feels comfortable enough to make I statements. You are not a you in the sense that when you talk about yourself, you don't want to say that we do something or that you do something and you talk about yourself in a third person or in a second person or in a first person plural. You're just one person. Your heart is precious. You want to start to make I statements in relation to where you're at. That takes a lot to do when you feel as if perhaps the person on the other end is looking for a reason to pounce on why what you're saying is not correct. So practice empathetic listening as the person is talking to you and just hear what they have to say. You don't have to give any advice. You don't have to say, do this or do that. Just listen. And all I want you to do is talk to the person next to you and answer this question that is the frame of this discussion. How do you prepare your heart for Ramadan? Because a lot of what we talked about now was just to give us a frame of what it means, like what we're actually preparing, what part of us we're preparing, right? We won't go too much longer, but just for a few minutes, answer that question with the person next to you, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss. How does one prepare their heart for Ramadan? Right? All of us know everything that we've done for the most part. You think about subhanAllah, the mercy that is the ability to forget. Because can you imagine if you remembered every single thing that you have done always and forever? Just haunt yourself in your head for the rest of your life, right? 
you have to be able to revisit it again and again. This is really important. Shaitan's goal is to not get you to commit the haram as an end, but it's a means to something. And if you slip and you make a mistake, embedded in our tradition is the notion that we're taught of a God who created us, that if we did not make mistakes, he would get rid of all of us and replace us with those who did, so that he would have a creation that would turn to him and seek forgiveness and come back to him, right? You get to a place where you do something that you shouldn't do. And now your mind gets kind of fixated to it. And you start to believe that somehow that act is greater than Allah's mercy, Allah's forgiveness, Allah's rahmah. You build up obstacles that start to keep you from seeing what is reality. And it just starts doubling down on itself. The number of conversations I have on a weekly basis with people who are college students, people who are young professionals, people who are in their 50s, 60s, and they start to just self-deprecate and hate on themselves, saying that I did this thing and I now don't think like I'm a good person. You create in your vision of yourself an opportunity to then understand who you know the divine to be. And it starts to become very limiting and suffocating, right? And nobody wants to be in that place. We used to do a retreat with undergrads. Did any of you ever go on that retreat before COVID? You went on it? No, I was shaking my head now. No, we have. Oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> That's like... Riri, you're so old, Riri. Yeah. You're like... <laughs> huh? Did we do the fire? You're younger than me? No. You're not younger than me? No. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. We used to do, as a part of that retreat, an exercise where we light a very large campfire. And there would be moments in the day where you'd go as a participant and just find a spot to reflect. And one of the reflections was rooted in this challenge of self-forgiveness. And we have people now sit and write about what they could not forgive themselves for. And then the end exercise was to come to the flame and the paper you wrote on, you throw it in as a release. As a process, you might think, is it that big a deal? We had people who were your age sitting in the seats you were sitting in who went on it and they struggled for like not five minutes, 10 minutes, but some were going back and forth. They were in tears. And as they threw this thing, you could see the release that was coming from them because they have to live with knowing what it is that they've done. Do you get what I'm saying? This is not the same as indifference. If you did something messed up to somebody and you don't own it and acknowledge it, that's also a sign that the heart's not where it should be. You get what I mean? It's a different concept. So you don't want shaitan to take your thoughts immediately to a next. Self-forgiveness can be hard in the frame of preparation. What else? What else do you talk about? What does it do to your heart when you do something haram? Anybody, say it again. I'm old, remember? Riri just said, I can't hear you. Yeah? It puts a dot on your heart. What kind of dot? A dark dot on your heart. Every time you engage in haram, right? So if this is your heart, and it starts to get covered up, right? Basira is the vision of the heart. If the heart starts to get overwhelmed now with a cloak, like literally covering it, it's going to be a problem. You can't, at this point in your relationship to faith, on your own, try to figure out certain things that become obstacles. So if it's hard to understand the relationship to this, I was on the phone with a guy this morning who's a grown man and his whole life, all he heard about was what's wrong and what he does wrong. And he learned the word haram and fard before he ever had anyone talk to him about who God is to him. He's not in a space where the application of the word is rendering for him now a sense of kind of revitalization and invigoration. It creates difficulty, right? 
because all he was told is black and white and haram, haram, haram. It's hard to then draw principle from the matter. This is only going to be something that is empowering if you're first able to determine who Allah is to you. And if you believe in a God that's an angry old man in the sky looking for a reason to punish you, then the haram is going to feel suffocating. The faraid are going to feel burdensome. If you believe in a God that believes in you more than you believe in yourself, a God that gave you this deen as a means of benefit and not a means to hold you back, the paradigm shift is one that takes place inwardly. Ours is a tradition that doesn't function just off the principles of irrational and rational modes of thought, right? That something makes sense to me or something does not make sense to me. You have to have also a third frame that is supra rational, that understands that something doesn't need me to understand it in order for it to be true. And so I couldn't tell you why, just like I couldn't tell you why fasting can yield taqwa. Just like I couldn't tell you why we pray three rakahs at Maghrib instead of 14 or whatever. I don't know. I also don't know what's going on that it creates the impact that it does. But in these things, Allah has put these consequences, good and bad. So if you do haram, you don't have to throw your back against the wall in defense, judge whatever else, but understand a potential consequence is that it now starts to cover your heart. That's not preparing your heart. That is neglect of the heart. Do you see what I mean? You want to, in both of these places, have good people that you could speak to. They're not going to jump to push you down or kick you while you feel low. The companions of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they committed haram. Ya Rasulullah, I drank alcohol. Ya Rasulullah, I've committed zina. There was literally a companion who came to the prophet and gave him a gift of a bottle of alcohol. And I mean, you know, and the prophet, and he had a person with him. And the prophet said, I can't, you know, I can't take it. Said it nicely. And then the guy didn't know what to do. So he told the person that was with him that go and just sell it in the market. The prophet said, you can't do that either, man. He doesn't know. He didn't flip out. He didn't make him feel like he was the worst of the worst. So when you're engaging in these types of understandings, recognizing the perspective on it and what the implication is, and then you just try your best. Getting out of a habit is not just as simple as I go cold turkey, but you try to go with strategy. Do you see what I mean? We had a woman in our community who was an alcoholic and she was struggling with her drinking problems. She came to talk to me about it. We worked on it a bit. And then she came close to Thanksgiving and she said, I'm really worried because I'm going to go to my family's house who they also all drink. And if I'm not drinking, they're going to wonder why. And that's going to be a problem. So I say, here's my cell phone number. Just call me if you have any issues. And then we had a conversation some weeks later. I said, how did it go? She said, it was amazing. They were so drunk. They didn't know I wasn't drinking. I said, I guess that's a good thing. I don't really know. And then she started working hard on it. And there were some days that were tough, some days that were better. And she got to six months where she hadn't drank anything. And I said, get your friends and let's go out for dinner. We didn't have to tell people what was going on, but the celebration of the achievement was for her. And it's okay for you to pat your back when you're doing things that are good. You don't want to hate on yourself. You definitely don't want to be the person that says to the other person that's struggling that, well, you shouldn't have been doing it in the first place anyway. Your prophet, he says, that refrain from the haram, you will be the most virtuous of people indicating the lofty nature of it is attached to something that's not so easy to do. And a lot of us turn to haram in the absence of community support, when we don't have real support systems to turn to. And this is important 
because you're going to have Ramadan in a community space, right? This is what Yasser is saying in the beginning, that we're going to all come together, which means everybody else that's in the room is also having Ramadan, not just me. And so I don't want to be the reason why somebody now has to turn back to something because I sat in my corner with my friends and didn't pay attention to the one person who was there for the first time. Or I hesitated in being able to express warmth and a welcoming attitude. We used to do classes here every weekend almost with different institutions. And we were doing a program in Stern. And there was a guy who was a new Muslim that came from an Irish background that joined us for a program in this place that was with a different organization from our own center. They just asked us to host it. We host a lot of events for probably a lot of organizations that you've heard of before, because they know they'll get a big audience here, alhamdulillah. This guy walked in to this place, excited to be with his Muslim brothers and sisters, goes down into the lower level of Stern where the class is happening in that big auditorium, if you've been there before, he walks in, gives salams to the first person he sees, and rather than returning his salams, this person said to this guy, why is your beard red? And he said, what do you mean? And he said, don't you know it's haram for you to dye your hair red? And the guy didn't go into the room. He walked out, got on a train, went to his hometown he grew up in, called up a bunch of his friends, and then just got high and wasted and drank because he was reconciling the pain that he was feeling. You get what I mean? Aside from the fact that that's not even haram what he said, the guy's beard is red because he has red hair, right? Do you see what I'm saying? So this point number two is important. People are going to experience their Ramadan different from you. And so where they are experiencing it, where they're at and where you are at, you got to just have kindness and gentleness across the board, right? That's just what the default has to be. Let's take five more minutes and then we can wrap up. What else did you talk about? How do you prepare for Ramadan? Okay, so why don't we say here you engage in reflection, right? Which is a practical thing. And you're inventorying like your day and your night. You just go at a pace that makes sense, right? You don't have to do a thousand things in the beginning of the day, but you just set goals. Today, I'm just going to get my laundry done. Today, I'm going to make my bed. Today, I'm going to try to pray at least two of my five prayers on time. Today, I'm going to try to tell my professor I need to step out of class to make my salah. Right? Today, I'm going to meet somebody new in the prayer room. Do you know what I mean? And at the end of the day, I'm going to look back and see what did I achieve and what did I go through, right? And then I have a metric of assessment and you just grow at a pace that's gradual. Does that make sense? Maybe one or two more people. And then I just want to read a couple of things to you. Anything else prep wise? How do you prep your heart? Yeah. There are certain adversaries that we deal with. There's the nafs, which is the lower self, the dunya, it's the material world. You have shaitan's waswasa, whispers, and you have hawa which is your desire. We're not going to get into it too much, but these are four adversaries to your spiritual growth. They want to keep you from growing, right? May Allah protect us from them. And again, they're real. If you don't pay attention, they won't mean to, they don't exist. It's much easier to be vulnerable to something predatorial when you're alone than if you're with other people. And so there's a dual role here. You want to ensure that the people who are allowed to be in your presence, they're able to be with you as who they are. And they don't have to become other than what they are in order to share space with you. Because then you're just creating the physical presence, but they're not there present from their heart. Do you see what I mean? Right? So community has two parts to it. You become a support for somebody, but you also now seek it out. Don't do things by yourself. Because then you're going to be stuck with all of this stuff coming at you, and it's going to make it that much more difficult. And the company, the environments that you're in, they're going to play a role. So if all day and all night you're stuck with people who you're the only Muslim in the group, you're the only person that 
looks like you, thinks like you, whatever. They're creating now mechanisms for you to start to be in a space where you jump from a certain shift, right? I've only experienced Ramadan with a family all my life. Now I have to figure it out on my own. It's not concrete in here. You're going to start losing parts to it. And then it's going to fall into this place where you're going to hate on yourself. I'm not able to do this. I'm not able to do that. So you surround yourself with some good people that help to, to motivate. Does that make sense? I want to read now just some hadith that go into this and then we'll wrap up there. And these are just about purification of the heart. How do you kind of soften the heart and what goes into the heart? Right? So for the first one, was one that we read already that in the body, there's a piece of flesh. If it is good, the entire body is good. If it is corrupt, the entire body is corrupt. Indeed, that's the heart, right? The companions asked the prophet, Ya Rasulullah, who is the best of people? He said, one with a heart swept clean and truthful in speech. There's a relationship between the state of the heart and being honest. If you tend to lie, you tend to break promises, break oaths. There's a correlation there, right? he says, what is a heart that is swept clean? He says, one that is God-fearing and pure. The one that is God-fearing and pure in which there is neither sin nor transgression nor envy. They said, who shows a sign of it? And the prophet says, one who despises worldliness and loves the hereafter. Right? So a way to get your heart ready, think and reflect upon the akhirah and its role in your existence. And think about the real nature of this dunya and what it means in terms of what's going to come next. Because this is going to be a drop in the bucket in terms of what is eternal existence. And they said, who shows a sign of it? And the Prophet says, alayhi salam, a believer with good character. There's a hadith that says, wealth is in the heart and poverty is in the heart. Whoever is wealthy in his heart will not be harmed no matter what happens in the world. Whoever is impoverished in his heart will not be satisfied no matter how much he has in the world. Indeed, he will only be harmed by the greed of his own soul. The servant does not attain the reality of faith until he loves for people what he loves for himself of goodness. Right? This goes back to the state of your heart. Again, you want to have a heart that's ready? You got to be in a place where you're sharing with others. In another hadith, if you want to soften your heart, feed the poor and pat the head of the orphan. It's very straightforward, but you engage in acts of kindness, you engage in acts of goodness, acts of charity, volunteerism, right? It manifests now in these ways. The one who wages jihad is he who strives against his lower self. In Ramadan, Shaitan is chained. And so now what you're going up against is just you and the nafs. And so the nafs is going to be what tells you that you sit while somebody else serves food and that you don't have to pray your extra prayers. They're not really that important. The nafsani thoughts are going to be something that you can take on, but they're going to give you an indication of how you elevate the, this, the heart. You must have good character and observe long periods of silence. By the one in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad, no one can behave with deeds more beloved to Allah than these two. And so understanding character refinement as a mode of heart preservation and finding moments of solitude, deliberate moments of stillness as a way to engage the heart. And these are all just taken straight from different hadith. And I'm going to pause there because I don't want us to go too much past time. He talks about fasting in different narrations, other hadith that go into it. And we can throw this link into maybe the WhatsApp group so people can read them. Spend some time reading the Quran and reflecting on these verses. And spend some time looking at narrations in our tradition that you draw meaning from and you try to reflect and contemplate upon. If you would like to listen to more, please donate to www.icnyu.org donate. 
For more of our virtual programs, go to www.icnyu.org slash classes. If you have any questions, email us at info at icnyu.org.